we're going to record this. How you get it back or how you would play it back, uh, I can get into it another time. Uh, I'm not a real techie, but I'm just kind of feeling my way through. And the coronavirus has obviously accelerated my knowledge of things like Zoom and teleconferencing and, wow, just a whole myriad of other things, just a whole myriad of, of, of other uh, technological things. Just to review, for those who were not here last week or even for those who were here last week, we are at the beginning of Chapter 1, Bill's Story. And the purpose of Chapter 1, the purpose of Bill's story, is not just to tell you about Bill Wilson so that you'll be more educated about his life. That is not the purpose of this. The purpose of this is to identify in. And through identification, we can better understand what's going on in this book that we call Alcoholics Anonymous. And Bill Wilson is somebody who may or may not have much in common with you. He was a northern guy. He was from, New, from Vermont. He was born in East Dorset, Vermont. He was born in 1895 on the 26th of November. His parents in 1906 got divorced. Bill was about 10 years old when this occurred. And Dorothy, which is his sister, uh, and him went to live with their grandparents, their maternal grandparents, the Griffiths, Fayette and Ella Griffith in East Dorset, Vermont. And Bill Wilson, as a young boy, was warned many times, many, many times, not to drink liquor. His father, Gilman Wilson, was divorced from his mother, Emily Griffith, when he was 10, as I told you. And the number one, two, three, and four reasons that they got divorced were because of Gilman's drunkenness, his alcoholism. And Bill Wilson's paternal grandparents, the Wilsons, they had a dreadful marriage, just a dreadful marriage. And the number one, two, three, four, and five reasons why the marriage of the Wilsons was just dreadful was because of the drinking that Bill Wilson's grandfather uh, did And one day his grandfather went up to Mount Elias in East Dorset, Vermont for a hike, and the wind was kind of blowing around up there, and he described it to his grandson, but he never drank again. But he was a dry drunk, and really his motivation for not drinking was he didn't want to lose his wife. He didn't want to lose his family. Uh, but he was a dry drunk, and for those who have been around dry drunks, a lot of times it's a, ch it's a chore because they are very mad, very scared, very kind of, uh, you know, um, emotionally charged people because they're not working any type of program. Now, the purpose, as I say, of this is to identify in with Bill. Maybe some of the things or all of the things that I've said have nothing to do with you and your life. But what we're going to endeavor to do today and what we're going to endeavor to do in the future until we're done with this chapter is we're going to look very detail in a very detailed fashion at the way bill thinks and the way bill drinks and we're going to look at the progressive nature of bill's alcoholism bill's story is divided into two sections the first eight pages is about bill's plunge into the nadir of his alcoholism and the second eight pages is how a recovery was affected therefrom by methods that are going to come to him through the Oxford Group movement. And remember last week we said Bill was a very smart young man. He passed the Edison test. The Edison test was a test given to boys at a certain age by Thomas Alva Edison's foundation. And if you could pass the test, it was about science and math. If you could pass the test, then you might be invited to study and work with, Bill, with uh, Thomas Edison as one of his apprentices. Bill passed the test but chose not to work with Edison because he knew Edison would always be the number one man at his company, and Bill wanted to be the number one man. So can I relate to Bill Wilson? 
you bet I can. Bill was very hard working, very, very diligent to task. And when he was a young boy and he was living with the Griffiths, he found up in his uh, grandfather's attic, he found a baseball glove and worked very hard at being a good baseball player. And he became his school's starting shortstop and co-captain of the baseball team. He also found a violin up there and he practiced tirelessly and became co-first chair of the violin section of his school's orchestra and played the violin all the rest of the days of his life. There's pictures of Lois and Bill making music together. Lois was quite accomplished on the piano, and Bill was quite accomplished at the violin. And for those of you who have been to Stepping Stones, which I recommend, Stepping Stones is in Bedford Hills, New York. It is the home where Bill and Lois lived out the rest of their adult life. And you can see his violin, and you can see Lois's uh, piano, and there's pictures of the two of them playing together. Um, Bill also read in a book that only an aborigine could fashion a boomerang that would actually come back to you, and he worked tirelessly after cutting a bunch of wood from the bottom of his headboard of his bed. He worked tirelessly and actually fashioned a boomerang that came back. And when it did, it almost took Grandpa Griffith's head off, but he actually got it to come back, and that took an enormous amount of dedication. So if you look at the way Bill is behaving and the way he's acting, you can relate to some of that stuff, I'm sure. Bill also suffered from an inferiority complex. He felt because of the divorce, and he felt because he was tall and lanky. He felt because he was very skinny, which I can't relate to, but he felt very, very inferior to other people. And we're going to take a look at that inferiority complex this morning. He also suffered from a lifetime of anxiety, clinical anxiety, and depression. Bill fell in at age 17 to the first of his, in, uh, of his many depressions. He became depressed in 1912, 1913. The love of his life was Bertha Bamford. And Bertha went to New York from Vermont to get what was described to young Bill as a routine surgery. She went to New York and she died on the operating table. And this threw Bill into the first of his many depressions. And he would come under the care of Harry Tebow. And while under the care of Harry Tebow, not at this time, I'm talking about later, after AA was formed, he became a patient of Dr. Harry Tebow. And in 1949, Harry Tebow changed the world when he wrote a paper. And the paper described alcoholism as an illness. And the American Medical Association and the American Psychiatric Association in 1949 said, based on this paper, that they would accept alcoholism as an illness. And that was when Dr. Silkworth uh, said to Bill Wilson, right before the 11th printing of the first edition, big book, you can put my name in there now. And for the first 10 printings, <laughs> sorry, for the first 10 printings of the big book, it doesn't say William D. Silkworth, M.D. It doesn't say any of that. It says blank, blank, M.D. because Bill, uh, or excuse me, Bill, because William Silkworth knew that these theories, these opinions were unfounded medically. They were just based on observation. And he told Bill, I'll write the opinion for you. Just don't put my name in there because if you do, they're going to run me out of the medical profession. Bill Wilson later in his life also came under the care of Dr. Timothy Leary, who he was uh, ran into in Boston, Mass. Now, Bill lived in New York, but Timothy Leary was a psychiatrist who treated Bill Wilson, and he put Bill as a uh, as a medicine for his uh, depression, he put him on a form of LSD. And they had to really kind of clamp down on Bill Wilson because he wanted to shout to the world that this LSD was a really great treatment for his depression. And they actually put 
guys around him at conferences, at conventions, to try to dissuade him from mentioning that because they thought that if he did, it was very, very dangerous. So wanting to do something that you're really not supposed to do, can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. You absolutely bet that I can. Is a very, very quick review. Again, a quick review on page one. It says, I forgot the strong warnings. I'm about midway through the first paragraph. I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudices of my people concerning drink. In time, we sail for over there. Over there denotes World War I. You've all heard that song over there. It's a World War I song. But listen to the next sentence because it's key. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. Notice it doesn't say I was very thirsty and again turned to alcohol. I was very whatever and again turned to alcohol. He was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. And so this is a window into the brain of Bill Wilson. Not a real window, a window about the size of a garage door. I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. And then he's going to describe being in England, and he's looking at a dog roll on an old tombstone about a guy, here lies a Hampshire grenadier who caught his death drinking cold small beer. A good soldier is ne'er forgot whether he dieth by musket or by pot. What is Bill looking at there? Now, Bill has started drinking before going over to England, when he was stationed in Plattsburgh, they would give the soldiers something called a cordial. I'm not quite sure what a cordial is. I'm not a drinker. Uh, if they gave him Chips Ahoy cookies or Reese's peanut butter cups, of course, I would be infinitely more familiar. But they gave him a cordial, and uh, he says, I was part of life at last. So can I relate to Bill Wilson? Yes. I was born... and. I'm assuming you're a compulsive overeater if you're on this line, bulimic, anorexic. Um, I'm going to assume that you were born with a feeling of terminal uniqueness, of terminal being different, existentially being different from the people around you, not really being able to fit in, not really feeling very comfortable in your skin. And I'm go Somebody's unmuted. Um, and I'm going to assume... I'm going to assume, actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to mute the line. Okay, great. I'm going to assume that if you're anything like me, that this feeling of being different from other people, not in a good way, but this feeling is a lot of what drove the engine of your addiction because the minute I take a Reese's peanut butter cup into my mouth, for about 10 seconds, the first one, not the 83rd one, the first one, when I take that Reese's peanut butter cup into my mouth and the smell of that chocolate is wafting into my nose and the smell of that phony, fake peanut butter is wafting into my nose and I feel that Reese's peanut butter cup in my mouth and it's going down my throat for about 10 seconds, 9 seconds, the world is a beautiful place. Now, Dr. Silkworth calls this the effect. And what is that effect? The effect is that sense of ease and comfort that comes instantly by eating that food. And there's no feeling in the world quite like it until you discover the feeling of the spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. The only problem with that feeling is that feeling is fleeting, temporary, liquid. It would be like trying to hold water in your hands. You cannot do it. Your hands may be wet, but the rest of the water has run through your fingers and you will eat more food and more food and more food and more food in, in search of that feeling of that effect. And the physical allergy makes it impossible for you to stop. So if you cannot stop once you've started because of the allergy, 
And you cannot stay stopped because of the twist of the mind in search of this relief from the intenable pain of not eating You are powerless over food like me and powerless like Bill over his liquor. And our lives have become unmanageable. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. And he is looking at a tombstone of a man who drank himself to death. And it has an effect on him. Does it have enough of an effect to stop him? No. You were scared by the doctor who told you you're going to die. You were scared when you saw that you didn't look like the other kids, that you couldn't behave like the other kids. You were scared, but it wasn't enough to stop you. The only thing that can stop you is hitting that bottom where the fear of more eating outweighs the fear of letting go of the food. You fear the disease more than you fear letting go of the food. And at that moment, recovery can take place. We're going to start today on page three. We have seen on page two that the first victim of Bill's alcoholism is the truth. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. Because until a lie is told that this time it's going to be different, This time, it won't hurt me quite so much. This time, it's going to be okay. Until that lie is told and believed, I cannot practice this disease. Truth be told, the disease must have darkness and lies to propagate. The disease will wither and die in the food, in the the truth, sorry, not in the food, in the truth. The disease will die in the truth. And that's why we need sponsors. That's why we need each other. And that's ultimately why God puts us together on the line this morning. Because without each other, chapter 2, there is a solution. Without each other, there's no one we can really be honest with. We all have pain. Even people that are not compulsive overeaters. We all have disappointment. We all have joy. We all have thrill. And we all have excitement. But no matter what we're going through, whether it's perceived as good or perceived as bad, we know, like no one does, that this is going to lead to more eating because the eating is the buildup of emotions which triggers the mind. The mind tells the body it's okay. The body reaches for the food, ingests it, and we trigger that physical allergy. Again, We cannot eat on the truth. We can only eat on the lie. And that's why Dr. Silkworth says, in his opinion, we cannot tell the true from the false. What is the real truth? Everything I've ever wanted in my life was destroyed by Chips Ahoy cookies and Kit Kat bars and McDonald's french fries. And yet I went to Chips Ahoy cookies. I went to I went to McDonald's french fries to kill the pain of my dreams being shattered by the very activity that I was now engaged in. That's my friends called insanity. I was cutting my throat to stop the bleeding of the cuts on my throat. Does that make sense? No. That's why it makes sense to us. I've eaten railroad cars full of Chips Ahoy cookie to kill the pain of eating railroad cars full of Chips Ahoy cookies. We understand, and I can hear your heads going up and down. I feel your heads going up and down. I know that you understand Does Bill Wilson understand this? Yes, he does. Now, before we begin, which is where we're at today on page three, what I'd like you to do is go to page one 
and it says here, I fancied myself a leader. I'm in the very last paragraph on page one, the one that starts with 22 and a veteran of foreign wars. I went home at last. The next sentence is, I fancied myself a leader for had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation. My talent for leadership, I imagine, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. So Bill is coming home from World War I with a lot of confidence. And one of the things we're going to look at is the progressive nature of his disease. But keeping in mind what Bill has just said, about how he fancies himself a leader. He has high hopes. He has high hopes. Just what makes that little old ant think he can move a rubber tree plant? Remember that song we sang as children? He's got high hopes. Okay, I won't sing. I don't want you all to hang up. But the bottom line is Bill Wilson has high hopes. Now let's go to page three. Let's go to page three, and it says, for the next few years, that's the middle of the page, for the next few years, fortune through money and applause my way, I had arrived. Now, here's the kid from East Dorset, Vermont, who never had much of anything in his life. Just your average Bill Wilson. He's in New York. He has gone on the road to gain access to information on many of these companies that these people are investing in. And the people on Wall Street are showering him with money and options. Options is, is an opportunity to buy stock at a pre-prescribed price. He is being showered with attention. Now, Bill Wilson self-describes as a stockbroker. He is not. What he is is a New York City stock speculator who makes his living selling his opinions to the investors for a piece of the pie. <laughs> They're living on Park Avenue. Lois is shopping at the finest stores. He's buying her fur coats. He's buying her a piano that she has coveted and wanted from the time she was a little girl. And he surprises her with one, and she is thrilled. He buys fancy suits. Things are going well. He's making money. Let's go on. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. No matter who we are, we've had good times and we've had bad times. Okay? My judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions. Now, let's take a look right there. Think of what this would do to your ego if you as a school teacher, you as a chemist, you as an insurance agent, you as a veterinarian, whatever it is you are, you as a housewife, whatever that may be, you as a whatever, the way you do things becomes a standard and people follow your way to the tune of paper millions. Think of what that would do for your ego. He is revered. People want to be close to him. He's one of the darlings of Wall Street. Let's continue and let's see where Bill goes from here. The great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. Drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life. I want you to make note of that sentence. Drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life. In other words, the drinking is working for him now. Now, food never made me look good. Being fat never made me feel good. But I'm going to tell you something that I wasn't aware of until I got abstinent. To a very great degree, eating Girl Scout cookies made me feel good. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. To a very great degree, Kentucky Fried Chicken made me feel good. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. 
So food took an important and exhilarating part in my life because until I reached a certain age, the food worked. It took that edge off. It made me feel like maybe even though I hadn't done my homework, maybe even though I hadn't worked hard on the long-term assignment, maybe even though I didn't have a girlfriend, maybe even though whatever, you can fill in the blank, maybe I could make it through another day. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. Make note of that in your mind. Drink was taking an important and exhilarating part in my life. There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in thousands and shattered in millions. Now remember, the roaring 20s is when we're talking about this here. We don't know, or they don't know what's coming. They don't know that the Great Depression is right around the corner. This roaring 20s, this post-World War I economic boom, at this point was the greatest economy that the United States had ever seen. It surpassed the post-Civil War economy. It surpassed the... Uh, revolutionary war economy and surpassed the war of 1812 economy by many, many times, many times. And people are expecting great things and even greater things. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair weather friends. Fair weather friends is the description that I want you to note because these guys really weren't his friends. They were his friends as long as he could make them money. And they were they were using each other. He used them almost like you'd use a, a female as arm candy. He surrounded himself with these people to bolster up his egos. Not just like psychophants and toadies, but the mere fact that they were with him made him feel stupendous. Just like if you, if you had a group of people that hung around you just because you're amazing and awesome and could do great things, and whatever you said was great, if you said brown, green, yellow, red, whatever, they all said, yeah, brown, green, yellow, red, whatever it is. Just think of how that would make you feel, having your own personal entourage. And this is what he's got, but they're really not in it because he's such a great guy. They're in it because they're hoping that some of this money will filter through down to them. Let's go to the next paragraph, and let's remember that what we're looking for here is the progression of alcoholism. Now, what do we learn in Chapter 3? Now, I know we're not on Chapter 3 yet, but I'm just going to bounce you ahead in your brain. Chapter 3 relies largely on the information that comes from a book called The Common Sense of Drinking by Richard Peabody. And Richard Peabody makes three clear points. The three clear points that Peabody makes are alcoholism is a fatal illness. Alcoholism is a progressive illness. It gets worse over time, never better. And that alcoholism, permanent, progressive, and fatal. It's a permanent condition. There is no eradicating it. Now, the sad thing about Peabody is, even though his mark on our big book and his mark on our history is undeniable and we couldn't have a program without him, he wrote the book, The Common Sense of Drinking, in 1931. But in 1936, three years before the big book of AA was published, he died of his own alcoholism. So he never did quite get to a solution being spiritual. He never really got up to the door of doing anything spiritual to alleviate these situations. He almost was there, but he didn't quite get there. But so impactful is Peabody's The Common Sense of Drinking that Bill Wilson's copy of The Common Sense of Drinking is in the AA archives as we speak. But let's take a look at this paragraph, beginning with my drinking assumed more serious proportions, and let's 
remember that what we're looking for here is the progressive nature of Bill's alcoholism. My drinking assumed more serious proportions continuing all day and almost every night. The remonstrances, what are remonstrances? They're protestations. People are getting on him about his drinking. A, when he's drunk like that, he's not making them very much money. And B, when he's drunk like that, he's very hard to be around. And C, when he's drunk like that, it's embarrassing to be around him. So a lot of these people are getting quite upset. The remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row. It's not a row, it's a row. What is a row? A row is a fight. A row is a conflict. So the, the protestations of his friends terminates in a fight, and I became a lone wolf. Now, we're going to spend a little time talking about just that sentence because this is our opportunity to go very slowly. Now, let's take a look at what's happened here. Bill Wilson has been dreaming about being the number one man, right? He, he fantasized that he was going to be at the head of vast enterprises on page one. Remember we talked about that? And now in the previous paragraph, Bill Wilson has a bunch of these fair weather friends, and things are going extremely well for Bill Wilson. But now, rather than do what it takes to maintain this friendship, to do what it takes to maintain these relationships, he's choosing liquor. Or, wait a minute, is he? No, the liquor is choosing him. The alcoholic takes the bottle, and the bottle takes the alcoholic. Is he really choosing it? And that's why you'll never hear me say, food was my drug of choice. Food was my drug of no choice. Once I took Girl Scout cookies into my body, my life, my thoughts, my actions were no longer my own. So here he is losing his friends. He's fighting with these people that gave him everything he's ever wanted, and yet he is going to choose the liquor and say, screw these people, I don't need them. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. You bet I can. And I sat alone on Friday nights while my friends were out dancing in bars and chasing girls and girls were chasing them. And I was alone and my food got very salty. And the reason that my food got very salty is I was 400 pounds, 500 pounds, 600 pounds, 700 pounds, crying tears into the food, and there was salt in my tears. I didn't want to be doing what I was doing any more than you wanted to be doing what you were doing. But I saw no way out. I couldn't get drunk on the food. It wasn't working anymore, and I couldn't stay out of the food. I couldn't get drunk, and I couldn't get sober. So everything I'd ever wanted in my life was to be like my friends and go to these places and do the things my friends were doing. And yet my actions were making me fatter and fatter and fatter. So the very activity that I abhorred, the eating, became the only activity that gave me solace in the storm. It is an insane situation. It is an absolutely insane situation. It is absolutely crazy. It's a form of insanity that the very activity of eating which had destroyed my life was the activity that I was engaging in to bring me peace. That my friends, is insanity. In chapter 3, we're going to see a sentence that says, the only thing we have to describe this behavior is plain insanity. And I kept doing the same thing again and again and again, hoping for different results. And they never came. 
There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. Many unhappy scenes. Now, you got to remember something. He loved Lois. Forget what you've heard that he was a womanizer. Yes, he was. There's, and there's no, there's no disputing that he was a womanizer. But he loved Lois. And Lois loved him. What was causing these ugly scenes? What was at the root of their problem? Not anything but his drinking. His drinking was getting in the way of everything he had ever wanted. He felt when he married Lois back in 1917, he felt that when he married Lois, that things were really going to go his way now. The Burnhams weren't so crazy about Bill Wilson. We're going to cover that in the next page. They weren't so crazy about him. He was younger than her. He didn't come from a great family. They felt she could really do better. But they loved each other, and that carried them across. There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous apartment. I can tell you this from my own experience. My weight and my food consumption were the number one concern of my mother and father right up to the day they died. They could be fighting with each other like cats and dogs as they did just about every day. And there was one thing that they would unite on, and that is, oh my God, what are we going to do about Harlan? And when my mother would say, or my father would say, what are we going to do about Harlan? They weren't talking about what are we going to do because he has mumps or chicken pox or a fever or strep throat. That's not what they were talking about. What they were talking about is what are we going to do about his eating? What are we going to do about his eating? And many of you who have heard my special editions or you've heard me in person or both you know that I have vivid memories of people yelling and screaming at my parents about how fat I was getting. Now, not everybody on this line and not everybody in OA is a compulsive overeater whose obesity level reached that of what I reached. Some of you on this line are probably bulimic. You made yourself throw up, maybe with a toothbrush, maybe with your hand. You made yourself throw up after eating large quantities of food and purge that food away through regurgitation, and that's bulimia. Some of you may be exercise bulimia, uh, bulimia, bulimic, bulimic, I couldn't think of Some of you may be exercise bulimic. Maybe you would eat quantities of food and then exercise for five, six, seven, eight hours at a crack, harming your body, ignoring your injuries, ignoring the pain that was coming from the top of your feet, your knees, your hips, your back, your elbows, your shoulders. And if you're spending six and seven and eight hours a day in the gym, you're ignoring other things in your life, and they weren't getting attended to. Maybe you get a high from starving yourself, anorexia. Maybe you, like Karen Carpenter, get high from restricting the amount of food that goes in your body. Whether or not you are a compulsive overeater of my variety, or you are an exercise bulimic, or you are an anorexic, or you are a uh, a, a vomiter, we all have the same disease. It just manifests itself in different ways. So rather than say to himself, if you're Bill Wilson, Now, I know none of you can relate to this. Rather than saying to himself, maybe I better adjust my behavior, he said to himself, screw these people, including frickin' Lois. Let them them change their behavior. See, we always look at it outwardly. We always look at it that the other person has to change. That's why we need sponsorships. That's why we need sponsorships, singular, sorry. Well, you can have more than one sponsor. But that's why we need sponsorship. 
Because, you know, if five people say I'm a duck, I better start quacking. Because a solitary self-appraisal proved insufficient. And that's why anybody that sponsors themselves has a fool for a sponsor. Bill Wilson was expecting the other people to accept his drunkenness. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. This isn't a window. This is a garage door into his soul. There had been no real infidelity for loyalty to my wife, helped at times by extreme drunkenness, kept me out of those scrapes. The intimation here is he got so mad at Lois that if he wasn't completely drunk, he might have taken advantage of other situations. I wasn't there, I don't know, not for the point of our discussion. What I can tell you is we're seeing the progressive nature of his alcoholism. It's destroying him. Now, we practice these principles in all of our affairs, don't we? And we talk about that at every meeting. We read the steps, and in step 12 it says, <clears throat> having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to compulsive overeaters and to practice these principles. What are the principles? The principles are the steps in all of our affairs. But what is the important thing here to notice, and that is, Alcohol wasn't just making him drunk. Alcohol was affecting every aspect of Bill's life. His finances, his romance, his sex life, his friends, his stature, his self-esteem. Should I go on? You see... One time a person said to me in Chicago, if all the food did was make you fat, it wouldn't be so bad. It's everything else that it destroys. It destroys all aspects of a person's life who suffers from this disease. Now, some of you that are on the line today are quite successful economically. You have no problem paying your bills. Some of you on the line have great marriages and great romances. Some of you on the line are saying, yeah, that really doesn't apply to me. Yet. The disease is progressive. So maybe, maybe you're well situated in one of these areas, let's say finance. But some of the other areas of your life are suffering if you're practicing the disease. And then when you start to practice the recovery, you start to heal in directions that you didn't even know were broken. You see, when you first come into OA, and I don't know how many of you are new, when you first come into OA, you get a boulder dropped on you from the sky. And a boulder falls on you, and on the boulder is written two words, food and weight. And you start to chip away at this boulder, and you get a year abstinent, and you're chipping away at it. And then you get two years abstinent, you're chipping away at it more. And maybe three years abstinent, you're chipping away at it more. And all of a sudden, you start to see, oh, crap, I'm a love addict. I didn't know that. So you start to heal in that area. Oh, crap, I'm a sex addict. You start to heal. Oh, darn, I'm a codependent. I start to heal. Oh, God, I'm overly concerned with what other people think of me. It's consuming me. What other people think of me. You know what most people think of me? Nothing. Nothing. But I'm so consumed by what people in China or outer Mongolia are thinking about me that it starts to destroy my life. What, and, and I'm told what other people think of me is none of my business. I don't care. I start to see, wow, I hate myself. But now I start doing self-esteemable activities in the form of service to other sick, suffering, compulsive overeaters, and I start to like me. You know, when you boil the meat from the bone, the relationship we have with ourselves and God are the only permanent relationships of life. 
We may love our spouses, love our children, love our parents, love our relatives, love our friends. But in the final analysis, it's what's going on in your skin. So these things, and I could go on and on here, but these are the things that happen, and the reverse is happening, not the healing, but the destruction is happening in Bill's life. Now, a lot of this information is, is, is relatively forgettable because we're working with somebody or we're in a meeting and we go through these, these paragraphs and we, we don't have the time to think about this. And to, to do. I'm asking you this morning to take that time so that you can be the better sponsor. You can be the better, the better um, uh, helper of this because these things are in there and they're important. So we're seeing how Bill is being affected by his wanton alcoholism. He didn't choose it. He didn't cause it. He can't correct it, but it's being chosen for him. So alcohol was not Bill's drug of choice. Bill was suffering, and alcoholism became his drug of no choice. The alcoholic takes the bottle, and the bottle takes the alcoholic. His home life is being wrecked. The friends are going. Let's see where he goes from there. In 1929, I contracted golf fever. We went at once to the country. Now stop right there. The Burnhams, Lois is a Burnham. We're going to talk more about that probably next week. But Lois is a Burnham. And Dr. Burnham had a summer home in Manchester, Vermont. Manchester, Vermont is is a place that we're going to be talking more about when we get to page 8 and 9. But Manchester, Vermont is right across from East Dorset, Vermont. And when we were in Boston for the World Convention about five years ago, and my sponsor, who is a New Yorker, uh, and drives like a frickin' maniac most of the time, took us out to East Dorset, Vermont. He was a good boy. Uh, he didn't drive that crazily when we went. But anyway, we saw Manchester, Vermont. We, we had lunch in Brattleboro, which we're going to be talking about in, in a while. Not today. We had, and Manchester is where the wealthy have their summer cottages. It's where the elite come to play. And right across from there is East Dorset, Vermont, where the normal kind of blue-collar workers live, and that's where Bill Wilson is from, and that's how he met Lois. So they had a place in the country. Now, we went at once to the country, my wife to applaud, while I started out to overtake Walter Hagen. Walter Hagen was a big golfer at that time, like Tiger Woods is now. Liquor caught up with me much faster than I came up behind Walter. I began to be jittery in the morning, delirium tremens. Golf permitted drinking every day and every night. Stop right there. Don't you dare continue. Notice the progression Notice what it says on page three. Notice what it says that that he's drinking almost every day, all day and almost every night. Now on page four it says drinking every day and every night. Golf permitted drinking every day and every night. What does that indicate? Progression of the illness. So don't read this and think to yourself, well, I think I'll share about what my dog did on the carpet. That's for your sponsor. Bring your mess to a sponsor. Bring your message of recovery to the meeting. Meetings are not to to, to bring your mess. Meetings, especially for those, and you know who you are, that are in the upper classes, Meetings are to share a message of recovery with the sick and suffering. So you see the progressive nature of the disease. He's going from drinking every day and almost every night to every day and every night. Very important to look at this. Heed what it is telling you. 
because it is the progressive nature of alcoholism that was described so eloquently by Peabody in The Common Sense of Drinking and then in Chapter 3 in the book you're holding in your hands. The reason I'm spending time on this is because it's important. Nobody gets to eat the way they did right before they come in here as children. It is a progressive disease. It is a progressive disease. He's drinking every day and every night. Top of four, it was fun to roam around the exclusive course, which had inspired such awe in me as a lad. I acquired the impeccable coat of tan one sees upon the well-to-do. The local banker watched me whirl fat checks in and out of his till with amused skepticism. Bill is still making money on Wall Street. He still knows a thing or two about investment. He knows how to play the stock market. But life as they know it is going to change. And life as they know it is going to change and it is going to not come back until the late 1940s, but none of them know that then. Abruptly, in October 1929, that would be Black Tuesday, Tuesday, October the 29th, 1929, the day that the start of the Great Depression. Now, at the risk of taking too much time with this, I want to illustrate for you what this means. Now, in 2008, parts of 2009, we had 15, 1.5% unemployment in this country. 15% of us were unemployed. The economy was in a very stagnant state. We had horrible economic times at that moment, and the government had a bailout and blah, blah, blah. Let's not get into the politics of it. Because that's not for OA. That's not for here. This arena is not for that. The reason that I'm pointing that out is I want to point out to you, for you, what's going on here. Overnight, unemployment among whites was 50 to 60 percent. Unemployment in blacks, Latins, Chinese, other minorities, 95 to 100 percent unemployment. There was no money. There was no jobs. There was nothing. The entire machinery of a working economy came to a halt. There was nothing. I don't want to get into a socioeconomic political discussion of the Depression. That is not our purpose here. The purpose is to illustrate the time in which we're looking at. Let's take a look at Tuesday, October 29th, 1929. It's the day everything stopped. Hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange, page four. After one of those days of inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was 8 o'clock. Notice he wobbled from a hotel bar. What was he doing in the bar? He was drinking. Was he thirsty? No. He was scared. He was angry. And that fear and that anger drove him to drink because the mental twist feeds off the buildup of emotions. And we have a lack of power as to how to handle that without drinking or a spiritual awakening. So he's wobbling from a hotel bar. He didn't walk out of the hotel bar. He wobbled from a hotel bar. Make note of that. To a brokerage office. It was 8 o'clock. Five hours after the market closed, the ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of tape which bore the inscription XYZ32. It had been 52 that morning. I was finished, and so were many friends. 
the papers reported men jumping to death from the towers of high finance. Why is high finance in capital letters? The reason that high finance is in capital letters is because it is what many on Wall Street believed in as their higher power. To them, money and the board was God. This high finance being capitalized is indica indicative of the fact that to many of these people, their worth, their value, their self-esteem, their ability to relate to other people was only a reflection of how well they did financially. And so they were stripped not just of money, not just of necessities. They were stripped of their dignity because they didn't have a spiritual program to say, I'm God's child, whether rich or poor, black or white, gay or straight, Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter who I am or what I am. I'm loved by a merciful, powerful God. They didn't have that ability. They probably thought their wives married them because they were doing well, or their friends were friends with them because they were doing well. And they wanted their children to go to the best. They wanted their kids to wear the best, just like anybody does, right? I would like, you know, I wish I had a wife, but I, if I had a wife, I wish I, that she would go to the best and wear the best and do that. Because not only do I want that for that person, but it's a great reflection on me. I hope I'm making myself clear. I hope I'm making sense here. And that was taken from these men by things that were not within their control. Now make note of the fact, because we're going to be talking about this a lot more next week, that disgusted me. So these guys are killing themselves. They're committing suicide. And they're going up to these buildings in New York and Chicago and Detroit, and Cleveland, and wherever, and they're killing themselves because they see no way out of this. That disgusted me I would not jump. I went back to the bar. Stop right there. Why did Bill go back to the bar? Because without knowing it intellectually, without being able to cerebralize what was happening when he drank liquor, he knew that when he drank whiskey, it did something for him, not to him, for him, that nothing else did. It instantly changed his perception of reality. Food. Not all food, not cauliflower, not unless it's breaded or cheese on it or something. Not cauliflower, not Brussels sprouts, not any of that. But Chips Ahoy and Kit Kats will instantly change my perception of reality. I'm in solitary confinement here, like many of you are, because of the virus. I don't see another person the entire day. What's bothering me is I'm going stir crazy here. Like many of you are going stir crazy. But I don't dare go to a lot of places because I don't want to take my life in my hands. I wish that was different. If I ate a Chips Ahoy cookie... Who cares about all these people? I couldn't care less. You see, that Chips Ahoy cookie changes my perception of reality. Bill goes back to the bar because he knows that that effect will change his perception of reality. Here's a little side note for you. Alcoholics, drug addicts, food addicts, almost never become psychotic delusional. Psychotic delusional means you're not living in the same reality that the rest of us are living in, and it is a permanent psychological condition of which there is no return. Once a person goes psychotic delusional, they can medicate you and care for you, but there's no bringing that person back. They're living in an alternative reality. 
Now, why don't alcoholics, drug addicts, and compulsive overeaters become psychotic delusional in the same number that the normal population becomes psychotic delusional? Because we already have a way of instantly changing what the brain sees. Isn't that interesting? We can use a Chips Ahoy cookie to change my perception of reality. Who cares about the virus? Who cares about no baseball? Who cares about no basketball? No, nothing on TV but the same garbage that I've seen 3,000 times. Who cares about the fact that I'd love to go on a date with a nice girl? Who cares about all that stuff? I got Chips Ahoy over here. Me and the captain. We used to do every, you know, Saturday morning cartoons. Me and the captain. Who's the captain? Captain Crunch. There's more sugar in a bowl of Captain Crunch cereal than there is in any farm in Hawaii, for God's sakes. And so... He goes back to the bar in search of that alternative reality that Dr. Silkworth so eloquently calls the effect. These little sentences here, these little words here, also indicate to me Bill Wilson didn't write this book any more than I wrote the Constitution. Bill Wilson penned the book, yes, I'm not denying that. I'd be a fool to deny that it was his pen that ran across the uh, the paper. Nobody's denying that. God wrote this book. God wrote this book. Why in the world would it be so timeless and brilliant and permanent and effective? Because God wrote it. That disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. I could do a whole weekend retreat. Just on that line alone. Let's continue. My friends had dropped several million since 10 o'clock. So what? Tomorrow was another day. So guys are killing themselves. The whole world is concerned to attend about what's going on on Wall Street. And Bill is saying, oh, so what? Tomorrow's another day. Why is he so insouciant? Why is he so insouciant, which means devil may care. You know, don't worry. Don't sweat the small stuff. Because he's drunk. He went back to the bar. He's drunk. He don't care what the hell the stock market's doing now. He's probably looking around. Maybe he notices a nice chair to sit on. He's sitting there getting drunk. He don't care what the heck is going on around him. He's got his smokes. He's got his liquor. Maybe there's somebody sitting next to him that he could talk to, be they male or female or whatever. He don't care what the heck's going on here. Everything is groovy. That's what food does for me. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. I was 20 years old, never been on a date yet. I continued eating. I was 25 years old. I had never been on a date yet. I continued eating. I was 30 years old. I had never been on a date with a girl in my life. I continued eating. I was 35 years old. I had never been on a date with a girl, and I stopped eating. It takes what it takes, guys. It takes what it takes. But as long as that food was coursing through my brain and my body then my asexual, lonely, depraved, physically painful, embarrassing, laughing stock of an existence was not a concern. Give me enough whatever, and I don't really give a damn. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. As I drank, the old fierce determination to win came back. And as I ate Kit Kat bars and I ate Almond Joys, I was going to be James Bond. I was going to be the quarterback of the Bears. I was going to be the first baseman for the Cubs. And those fantasies, as ridiculous as they sound here on the phone on this Saturday morning, were very real to me. 
everything was going to be okay. But I wasn't working toward it being okay. I wasn't working toward any goals. I was just thinking that maybe it'll be okay because I'm Harlan Grabowski and somebody's going to come along and they're going to take care of me and everything's going to be okay. It doesn't work that way. Can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. Let's see if we can plow through the next paragraph and we'll be done for the day. Next morning I telephoned a friend in Montreal. That's his friend Dick Johnson. He had plenty of money left. <clears throat> Excuse me. And thought I had better go to Canada. He goes to Montreal. By the following spring, we were living in our accustomed style. Everything's going well now. He's starting to rebound now. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba. No St. Helena for me. St. Helena is where Napoleon will get banished to, where he will never regain his territory. And from Elba, he will get banished, and he will amass his forces and retake France and retake parts of Europe. So Elba is good, St. Helena is bad. St. Helena now, by the way, is a big tourist place. A lot of people, not now, but a lot of people go there for uh, vacations and stuff. They go to St. Helena. But anyway, drinking caught up with me again, and my generous friend had to let me go. This time we stayed broke. So they're coming back from Canada with their tail between their legs. Bill's drinking once again has pulled the rug out from under his dreams and has pulled the rug out from under his aspirations and his work. Bill has been defeated by the liquor once again. Even in the face of seemingly temporary victory, seeming temporary victory, the alcohol had its way with him and he's coming back drunk and broke. Now, can I relate to Bill Wilson? You bet I can. Can I relate to the way he thinks and the way he drinks? You bet I can. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit of a backstory, and then we're going to be done for the day. And I'll take a few questions, but before I take any questions, I just and I'm going to go over this again next week, but just for the sake of giving you the story, because if I do it now and I do it next week, it'll sink in better. Bill Wilson was disliked intensely by his father-in-law. Dr. Burnham was a gynecologist. He was also a surgeon, and he was also a genetics doctor. He was a brilliant man. He was a genetics doctor, a gynecologist, and a surgeon. And when they get back to New York, they are going to try to get pregnant. And Lois is going to suffer from a few ectopic pregnancies. And the second or the third ectopic pregnancy, rather, I think it was the second, she starts hemorrhaging, and she calls her father and says, Dad, this is in the days when doctors made house calls. Some of you are too young to remember that, where you called the doctor and they came to your house. Uh, and they could park anywhere they wanted to. They had MD on their license plate. They could park in front of a hydrant. They could park in a no parking zone, whatever, because they were on a call. But anyway... Lois is taken to the hospital by her father, and at 7 p.m., he leaves a note on the kitchen table where, the, where Lois and Bill were living. And he says, Bill, we're at the hospital. Come immediately. Lois is in a bad way. 9 o'clock, 9.30 the next morning. 14 hours after the note was laid on the table, into the hospital comes Bill Wilson, unshaven. He had obviously pissed in his pants. He didn't shower. He didn't shave. He didn't clean himself. He hadn't brushed his teeth. He had obviously vomited several times the night before. There's vomit on his tie and on his coat. 
He comes into the hospital, and the nurses are instructed to let no visitor come in without seeing Dr. Burnham first. And Dr. Burnham says to Bill Wilson, look at you, you bum. Look at you, you bum. You stink. I can hardly be in the same room as you, and I'm a doctor. You look terrible. Lois almost died last night, and you were out getting drunk again. Now, with all that in mind, the next line, the first line of next week and the last line of this week is, we went to live with my wife's parents. Can you imagine? 182 Clinton Street, they're going to move in to the Burnham's house on 182 Clinton in Brooklyn. He's unwanted there, and they make him aware of that. The only reason they are giving him a roof over his head is because their daughter seems to like him. We're done for the day. I'm going to continue next week. Next week, we're going to continue on page four with we went to live with my wife's parents, and we're going to have a long discussion about that paragraph and move on. But for right now, I don't know. I hope this was helpful today. But it's now 1117. Let's take about two or three questions, depending upon how long of an answer they're requiring. And if you'll push star six, you can, um, you can ask your question, and I'll do the best I can. The only favor I'm going to ask you is please, no food questions. It's a waste of time here. It's just a waste of time. So who has a question about today's reading? Boy, I must have covered the material pretty good, or you all hang up when I started singing. I don't know. I don't know which one was which. Anybody with a question? All right, I have a question. Was today helpful? That's my question to you guys. Was today helpful? Because I know we go into minutia here. We go into very great detail. Oh, I'll unmute you. I'll unmute you. Hold on just a second. To unmute the line. Okay, it says unmuted on my thing. If you'll hit star six, you'll be fine. Trust me, hit star six, you should be okay. Okay. Okay, I don't know, maybe... Um, playback. Uh, I'm going to hit star 